Greetings to you in this strange, bold new format of our symposium today. My name is Gemma Williams and I'm a final year PhD student at the University of Brighton researching autistic communication. When it was first suggested to me that I might be autistic by my mother, my first thought was couldn't you have decided this 25 years ago when you saw me lining up the four sausages I'd insist on eating every day into their customary 45 degree angle? But my second and most enduring thought was I can't be autistic because autistic people don't experience empathy. Lack of empathy in autism is a prevailing trope in the characterization of autistic people in the public domain. It's one of the few things most people think they know about autism, even if they don't know much else. So for myself then, I knew that I felt things very deeply. I knew that I was sensitive to the emotional pain of others around me. And I could even feel pain physically in my body when I saw violence or injury on the television. So if anything, I had an overabundance of unnecessary empathy, so I couldn't be autistic. So this talk firstly will be about why that's wrong and what current understanding emanating from the social sciences is telling us about autism, theory of mind and perspective taking. Secondly, I'll talk a little about why that matters for your practice if you're somebody who may come into contact with autistic people or their loved ones in a clinical setting. And finally, I'll share a little of what I've been working on during my PhD uh, research into autistic communication. So my lack of knowledge about theory of mind at the time of that discussion with my mother about autism also included a lack of understanding about empathy uh, itself and the difference between emotional and cognitive empathy which is reasonable enough because the two are often conflated both in lay terms and sometimes in the scientific literature. So what's mostly spoken about um, in autism is the latter, what's known as theory of mind. Um, theory of mind is the ability to perspective take of oneself and of others. And it's also known as mind reading or mentalizing. It's widely accepted as um, one of the fundamental aspects uh, of human social cognition. Simon Baron Cohen described it as one of the quintessential abilities that makes us human. And while even chimpanzees are thought to have this ability, autistic people apparently do not. For a long time now, then, it's been taken as fact that autistic people possess cognitive deficits that result in the ability to detect or make sense of the states of others. But there are some issues with uh, this theory that have come out of research as it's progressed. Firstly, uh, the idea that typically developing children and adults consistently perform at ceiling level in theory of mind tasks has now been challenged. Secondly, the primary research tools that this theory is based on, um, a false belief task known as the Salian test, um, there's an image at the top you might recognise, um, where a child is asked to observe a short scene unfold, uh, that you can see in the picture, um, in which one character puts an object, for example some chocolate, in a basket, and then while outside of the room a second character comes and uh, removes and hides the chocolate and the child is asked where the character, the first character, will look for it. Um, so this test has been challenged 
um, quite a lot over recent years, not least because uh, passing the test requires abilities other than theory of mind. And there is more to theory of mind than is actually tested. Um, and finally, this theory has been based almost exclusively on studies involving uh, preschool age children comparing age matched participants. Um, so a recent longitudinal cross sequential study tested children between the age of three and 11 across a period of a year and a half with an extended six step theory of mind measure. And they found that in fact, most autistic children like their typically developing and deaf peers do continue to make substantial theory of mind progress during the school years. So they don't um, reach the same level at the same age, um, but they show steady individual progress. So some much more uh, recent empirical autism research situated largely in the social sciences has begun to illuminate the difficulties that non-autistic people also experience in understanding autistic people. These have included the difficulty in inferring autistic affective and mental states, including the difficulty in reading autistic facial expressions, and a tendency toward negative thin slice judgments about autistic people. Some additional research has also highlighted how autistic people can in fact demonstrate highly successful and nuanced socio-communicative abilities when among others of a similar neurotype, i.e. with other autistic people. So these findings all support a theory that's been termed the double empathy problem. Um, based on his own experiences and anecdotal evidence from the autistic community, autistic scholar Damien Milton proposed the term the double empathy problem and he describes this as a disjuncture a disjuncture and reciprocity between two differently disposed social actors. According to this approach misunderstanding is not just a consequence of an autistic impairment it's a mutual problem. And this accords with a move towards viewing the act of perspective taking itself as an interactional achievement rather than a cognitive property of a single mind. This was demonstrated really nicely um, in a study by Heisman and Gillespie at the London School of Economics. So they adapted um, a model some of you might be familiar with, uh, Lang's uh, 1966 IPM model of intersubjective perspective taking in couples therapy. And they used it to explore how the double empathy problem might be measured in terms of understandings and misunderstandings between autistic individuals and their family members. So both the autistic person and their family member were asked to rate themselves the other and predict the other's rating of themselves in relation to 12 topics. So for example, um, I might be asked to rate myself on how good I am at socialising, um, to rate my father on how good I think he is at socialising and then predict what rating he would give me when he's asked how good is Gemma at socialising. And what they found was that autistic people were able to accurately predict their family members' low ratings of them, despite disagreeing with their view. So 
So I wanted to spend um, just a moment considering why this might matter for psychiatric clinical practice. And I think there are um, two main reasons. Firstly, knowledge of the double empathy problem potentially helps clinicians or therapists be aware of their own limitations in the sense that it provides a reason for the clinician to cultivate epistemic humility, i.e. proceeding with minimal assumptions in their interpretation of the autistic client or patient. So, for example, um, it may be that some aspect of body language might usually be an indication of X characteristic or thought pattern or emotional state based on a non-autistic perspective. Whereas, in fact, it may be a sign of something totally different in an autistic patient. Secondly, the double empathy problem is a potentially useful concept for enriching understanding of the problems of the patient. So, for example, if there's a couple and one uh, member is autistic and the other non-autistic, from a double empathy problem framing, issues might be stemming from relational dysfunction between two profoundly differently disposed social actors, rather than what might typically be approached as a problem arising out of an autistic impairment. So in which case, focusing on treating or trying to change um, the autistic could be more harmful than helpful. So this knowledge might inform what kind of treatment or approach is required for example, in this case, perhaps uh, systems therapy is more relevant than individual therapy. So finally, um, my PhD research has been investigating the double empathy problem from the perspective of cognitive linguistics. Since Leo Kanner's early observations, there's been a long held belief that a pragmatic communication of autistic people i.e. the contextual, uh, the social uses of language that rely on inferred or implicit meaning, is impaired. This is something that's usually attributed to the presumed theory of mind deficit. So I've been exploring how these pragmatic impairments that have been attributed to autistic people might be reframed using the double empathy problem as a mutual breakdown of understanding. So, Autism is characterised by perceptual and attentional differences that are present from birth, as no doubt you all have heard about in other talks today. Um, sensory information forms the building blocks for higher order social and cognitive functions. So it makes sense that these differences would affect both uh, what is salient and how representations are organised. So what's um, relevant and most easily accessible in an autistic mind may be quite different to what's most relevant and easy, easily accessible in a non-autistic mind. This is the case for all pairs of individuals. Everyone has a different set of representations available to them at any given time. But I would argue that the gap between what's at the fore of an autistic mind um, and the four of a non-autistic mind at any moment um, is wider. So far, my work seems to be finding um, that this gap can be bridged to some extent, where both parties make their extra cognitive efforts to consider what the other might mean. So one analogy might be the difference in how you approach listening to someone talking about a topic you're unfamiliar with that you really want to understand versus the kind of skim listening to something you're not as interested in and you're already quite familiar with. Um, another analogy uh, might be the kind of heightened effort used to have a discussion with someone in your second language where the words may not exist or be known to you for the concept you're trying to convey. So I'll finish here with the words of Jim Sinclair, an autistic autism rights activist. It takes more work to communicate with someone whose native language isn't the same as yours. And autism goes deeper than language and culture. 
Autistic people are foreigners in any society. You're going to have to give up your assumptions about shared meanings. You're going to have to learn to back up to levels more basic than you've probably thought about before, to translate and to check to make sure your translations are understood. You're going to have to give up the certainty that comes with being on your own familiar territory of knowing that you're in charge. Thanks very much for your time. I hope it's been helpful in some way. There'll be a few more seconds now while the references flash back up on the screen in case you'd like to follow up any of the studies that I've mentioned. And my uh, Twitter handle is there too if you would like to be in touch. Um, so thanks very much again and I hope you enjoy the rest of the symposium.